Zeta, Alethio, Koi Gecko, and I'm the sentiment. And I'd like to thank the Ethereum Foundation and all the volunteers who have made this week possible. Um, before we get started with our first speaker from Koi Gecko, I'd just like to let you know that this is going to be an interactive session. So if you come here today with um, need related stats, needs, um, challenges, or something that you can contribute to the community, please feel free to write on the post-it notes that are on the edge of, of your uh, uh, aisle seat, um, and then we'll make sure we get through that today. Um, yeah, so before we get started, just a quick context of why we're here. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, Maxime, founder of an, uh, CEO Sentiment. Before, uh, before I did join Crypto in 2016, I spent like seven, eight years in the, the yoga community. So I was learning actually studying yoga and meditation. And uh, the few things we learned there is that there is no distinction actually between what we hear in our head and what we see in the world. In the yoga, we like don't make difference. What I have here, what I see outside, all the same, all the one. And the second thing, we do see a lot of challenging or like painful or sometimes ugly things uh, around us in the world. That's why I think by sitting here, we want to improve it. But the way we, we improve it is uh, uh, not like we destroy, and we are just trying to make stuff better, step by step, slowly, slowly. And uh, we are here with uh, different uh, uh, projects. And we are doing one thing all together. We're trying to uh, uh, make better, easier for, and I'm talking now on a practical level, people work with the data. And we do it maybe from different angles. It doesn't matter if we are different projects. Still, we're doing one thing. And we in one room to make it uh, better uh, or show other people how can they uh, jump on board very fast? How can they uh, be part of what we're trying to change in the world? How can we all of us be inclusive and at the same time still keep our focus on what we're doing? It's good thing to be a little bit different. So uh, everyone who will come on stage, please share what you've got uh, and give it to people outside and, and see how we can iterate. platform for tracking cryptocurrencies and blockchain assets. Since founding CoinGecko in 2014, TM Lee has closely followed the development of crypto economics and the real-world applications of blockchain, blockchain technology. Apart from that, TM Lee is a contributing author of two books on the topic of digital currencies published by Elsevier. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and a minor in Psychology from Purdue University. Recently, he was also listed on the under 30, um, 40, 30 under 30 Asian 2019. Please join me in welcoming TMA. Thank you, Serena, uh, for this opportunity. So, um, for those of you who have followed CoinGecko, basically we are a market data provider. Uh, but for this case, we had some research work that needs to be done on Ethereum data set. So, this is more like uh, sharing the experience that we face in terms of um, Finding all these data points on the Ethereum blockchain, we'd like to share with you the options that are out there. Um, so yeah, so in, in, this, in this case, we are not going to be interested in making transactions or making contract call and changing the state of the Ethereum blockchain. We're just going to get down to exploring the data that is already on the chain. And um, typically, the kind of data that you're interested in are like blocks, blocks and transactions, uh, smart contract, like how much balance are in some contracts, uh, the events that are meted, uh, these are addresses, uh, and some, some events that they were locked from the contract when something happened. So, when we first got in, uh, the most obvious thing to do is to run a full node, right? Your options are like GAF or Parity, uh, and then you have that node running, uh, have it synced up, which takes like a couple of weeks, and then run some RPC calls and turn that out into a CSV or some sort of data that you can use to consume. So this is great, uh, you get full control, you have all access to data, but it's quite tedious for us who just want to get down to the data uh, and, and get running uh, immediately. The second best option is to use a node as a service. So you could run the fewer alchemy instead of running the node yourself, and then plug in the same way exactly how you interact with full node, using RPC calls, some code to churn up CSV. 
this is great, it kind of solves the purpose, but then again, it might be doing too much than what we expected. So the third option is to abstract everything out and consider using a third-party API service. So what they do is that uh, the third-party API service will probably point out certain key things that people are interested in and abstract it out. So we only interact with the RESTful API to get like JSON or CSV for us to work and analyze those data. So uh, a few examples that you could choose from are like Etherscan or Ember Data. Uh, you probably need to pay some sort of money subscription for some of this. Uh, great thing is there's no setup, there's no need to work with full nodes, and these data are indexed. So you can quickly just grab all this data immediately based on what the uh, third party offered. So the last one here, which is something that I think lots of people are not aware of, uh, which I would like to share a little bit more because this is what we ended up uh, using on our site, is uh, the BigQuery data set for Ethereum. So I think this announcement was made end of uh, last year, where Google had this initiative where they would index the entire uh, Ethereum blockchain onto BigQuery, which makes it really easy to extract certain set of data. Um, so the great thing about uh, Google BigQuery is that the data that you extract, which could be as large as you want, can then be integrated with all the other Google services should you need to do so. And you could also export it out into a CSV or JSON, just like how you would deal with an API. So this is quite nifty. Um, the, the difference here is that the data updates every six blocks, but this is kind of unofficial because you can't really find the kind of documentation out there. Uh, documentation says that it updates every 24 hours, but based on my experimentation, it updates almost every six blocks, which is kind of uh, good enough, not real time. Uh, you pay for, for, for query, and it's good for non-developers. So if you have statisticians or people who are not technical, uh, they could just get down to this without any setup of API to get those data up. So this is an example, like I want to find the addresses that have significant outbound transactions uh, transfer for USDT. I could easily uh, plug in a BigQuery uh, SQLite uh, instructions, make the call, uh, keep in mind that the charges is five, uh, $5 per terabyte, so it really depends on how much data you extract. You could be a little bit smart in how you choose the, uh, the keys that you want to uh, query in order to save costs. But pretty much this is your constraint in terms of uh, costs. And then you have your options, you want to export it to CSV, JSON, you could do so. And this is a, a art piece from that data point that I extracted out. Basically, the large circle that you see, which is not very clear, but those large circles shows addresses that has large amount of outbound transactions. So these may point out to be exchange addresses, if you will. So these are the kind of things that you can do in BigQuery. You can easily extract out data, pop it into a, a, a graphing uh, solution, and get some data out of it. Um, and then before I came for DEF CON, I think someone was sharing uh, something quite interesting where imagine something like BigQuery, but it's social where you can share the queries and the results around. And it also acts like a notebook, like a Jupyter notebook. I'm not sure if you've used some of this Python Jupyter notebook where you could uh, lay out uh, 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 text together with some explanation of data. And that service is called uh, Dune Analytics. Uh, I highly encourage uh, to check it out as well because uh, all these data are available out there for free. You can just quickly make queries, extract it out, uh, and there's one example uh, on this ferry contract about how the ferry contract uh, affect the, the price of gas and these are some interesting insights that people share. So I highly suggest that you guys check it out. So the key takeaway is that there's plenty of tools to choose from, um, all the way from having uh, as much control as you want over to uh, as easy to get started. So there's always going to be trade-off, but it really depends on what your objective is. For us, we just want to get in, extract some data, fix some analysis, we went to that side. But if you want to get more control on data, we could lean towards the other side of the spectrum. So really, there's no barrier entry for data uh, analysts, statisticians, or, uh, or developers to explore Ethereum data set. Just go out there, go crazy, and grab all this data and analyze all you want. Um, other than that, just a little note that uh, CoinEco has a data API, uh, not on-chain API, uh, not on-chain data though, but market data only. Uh, you could uh, use it if you like. And that's all I have for now, which is a quick highlight on the options for exploring the dataset. I hope this is useful to you, uh, while we also continue to learn about this space as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm open to any questions, and I'll try my best to answer this. Yeah. Um, what were the costs of using BigQuery for you? Like, how much did it pay? Right. So, yeah. So, for example, uh, for this one, 
when you enter the query onto BigQuery, they will actually run an estimation of how much data you will process at the bottom right. So this is before you actually execute it. Google will tell you like how much gigabytes or terabytes of data you are using, and then you have to do the math yourself. Uh, so like it says here five dollars per terabyte. Um, I think the first one terabyte is free. So as long as you don't hit the threshold, you don't have to pay anything. But once you do hit them, then uh, for every one, for, you have to throw away uh, five dollars for every like bytes of one terabyte that you use. So uh, it really depends on what you want to create out of it. But you could stay within the free tier if you are uh, uh, creative enough with the queries. Can we try to run like a, a distinct <coughs> an API yourself, like other people accessing? Yes. I think it could become quite expensive in that case. Yeah, so, so BigQuery is a uh, data warehousing solution. So it's not supposed to be plugged into a front end, uh -huh. if I imagine. Okay. Most likely, if you're going to use this for an application, it will be like a background batch processing mm -hmm. where you could control uh, the, data, the, the flow of data or the query of the data rather than being queried by the outside world. So, uh, if in the Amazon side, I think you char they charge you for storage, uh, but then you don't have to pay for query. But for big queries case, if you put data in there, it's free. But every query that you make, they will charge you uh, $5 for every data. Yeah. Yeah, in other words, the question on the big query side, did you upload your ABI before uh, to generate the queries? Or how do the Maybe token transfer is just a very standardized right. thing that is support, but is it possible to get very fine grain? Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why, uh, in terms of control, uh, maybe BigQuery may not give you everything that you want. So this is just some extra slide. So if you go into BigQuery, you can see the list of tables that they have indexed already on their site. Uh, so blocks is pretty obvious. It's uh, blocks data. Uh, contracts are contract with a bytecode. Uh, so I think you need the ABI itself on top of it once you extract this data up. Uh, logs are contract events. Uh, token transfers, which is the one that we use. Uh, these are tokens metadata. There's not much data in there. Parity traces, I haven't used them, so I don't really uh, know what that is. Uh, last one is uh, transaction data, which is every Ethereum transaction that out there. So you are constrained within uh, this set of table. If this gives you what you want, you could go ahead and use it. Anything other than that, you might have to go up one level, API or load. The, the logs here, I think, will be binary, so you need to have the ABI to decode the. Yeah, you have to decode the. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you can have a user defined function to actually decode it. Right? Mm, you probably have to do it yourself. So, like, one example of the kind of data you would get would be. I'm trying to see if I have anything here. Yeah, so, so you, you're probably going to get it in this form. Right? So, if you're a developer, you have to call like, the, the web tree function or. And, and decode this into something that human understands. So you have to chop it out. Is there any other questions? <coughs> right, I guess I guess we're good for now. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. And just while we're getting set up with the next, yeah, here we go. Um, I'd now like to introduce Sean Douglas from Agrodata. Um, a platform for monitoring, searching, and analyzing public and private blockchains. Um, prior to founding Amadata, Sean served as president, of, as president of software and CTO at Unified, building and operating the company's rapidly expanding SAS offerings in cross-platform data management, analytics, and reporting. He has held roles as board member, operating executive, technologist, advisor, and investor. Sean is a graduate of the Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Sean Douglas. All right. So uh, Sean Douglas from Amber Data. We combine blockchain data and market data into a single data platform and serve up uh, a RESTful API as well as WebSockets as well as RPC so you can connect and access data and understand what's going on on chain. We support seven blockchain today as well as about 20 exchanges uh, on a path to about 20 blockchain by a year. So uh, I want to just kind of quickly frame what is going on, what is happening right now with crypto and Ethereum. So everybody believes this is a massively disruptive opportunity. There's, it's about $300 billion in market cap right now across all of the, the tokens and digital assets. But we are creating an open financial system. We're creating potentially a new internet. And this 
this is going after a disruptive opportunity that actually disrupts cloud computing, remittance, payments, store of value, fee of currencies. So why is that work and why is it so disruptive? It's because, because of what everybody here in this room is building, we're able to delegate trust systems that are radically transparent, that provides transparency that's not available in traditional financial markets, that drives network effects, aligns incentives, drives behavior, and has a very low barrier to option that we can all develop against. And I used to be a venture capitalist, like you were saying earlier, is you're always looking for things that drive network effects, that have social networks, that incentivize behaviors. Crypto massively enables that. And, you know, it's crypto, it's crypto, crypto, I can't talk shit, crypto economics <laughs> is the uh, fundamental reason why this is so uh, massively disruptive is because, because that we can create these mechanisms that incentivize behavior, and because data is an input, and data is an output to these systems, we can understand what's going on, and we can drive the network effects. So with that said, um, today, if you think about Ethereum, Ethereum is about $18 billion in market cap, that's like AMD. It's, it's become an industry. Everybody here in this room is creating an industry. If you look at the top 50 tokens that are trading on Ethereum, that's about $11 billion in market capitalization, and those about $17 billion per day trade in that. That means two, almost two times the total market cap of those tokens is trading on the top 50. Um, so it's, it's become a, a, it's not what we have, were doing last year. Now I'm going to dig into the data um, to actually show kind of crypto economics in action and the evolution of what's being built on chain. So this chart is pretty interesting because if you look, think about um, the most simple form of crypto economics, it's like I'm going to be a miner, I'm going to mine blocks, I'm going to get rewarded, and that's going to keep the system in balance, keep the system safe. What we can see here is that. Um, over time when the Ice Age set in, in last year and you were starting to actually see the, the block time slow down, <coughs> there was a lot of congestion in the network and they had to do the Constantinople hard fork and then once they did that, the system went back in balance. And um, so it's, it's a pretty good depiction of, of crypto economics in action and the most simplest form of proof of work. Um, so you can also see, we're starting to see now, um, if you go back in time, during the, the, the big ICO bubble or what have you, there was a lot of transaction activity on chain, but really that was mostly single token transfers. Today though, we're starting to see, we're almost at the same point where we were previously with the number of transactions on, on chain, except the composition of those is very different. The composition of those, what this is showing here, is that the actual transactions on chain today, here, this is wallet to wallet transfers, and these are smart contract transfers, including smart contracts and tokens. <laughs> and Ethereum serves to be a global computer, and global computers run code, run software. And what we're seeing here is that the actual majority of activity on Ethereum is actually interactions with smart contracts. It's not just transferring value, which is great because that's what we're all here for. Now, the whole network runs on gas. What we're seeing here is that, in fact, People, the consumption of gas that's driving these smart contracts is the um, kind of the lifeblood of what's happening on Ethereum, and you're seeing it's it's becoming true. This is uh, this is you know what we had set up to. Everybody in this room has set up and participating in building. We're actually starting to see it come to fruition, and you can measure the adoption and utilization of smart contracts by gas consumption, but. Let's get some, a lot more interesting. Everybody here has probably built orchestrated systems and, and uh, uh, microservices and what have you. Well, last year, what you would see is you would literally see a smart contract would execute a transaction, it would transfer a token, that was it, it was done, right? But what we're seeing now is things like uh, DX, DYDX and 0x, you're now seeing orchestration across multiple contracts. So this is, has a call stack of about six calls deep which means there's a lot of interactions with different uh, um, smart contracts. So we're seeing, this is, you know, going back in time, there was literally just token transfers over here. However, now we're seeing orchestration across multiple smart contracts at five, six levels deep. So you're seeing much more complex applications 
with interactions and dependencies being built. It's, it's really an evolution, a maturity, and the realization of much more powerful dApps uh, being built. You know, back in the day, it was CryptoKitties was this little ecosystem, and MakerDAO was this little ecosystem, and they really were islands amongst themselves and didn't interact. However, with the advent of 0x, where you could actually swap one token for another, we can now start to see people connecting independent dApps together and orchestrating transactions across these to enabling token swaps. With Compound coming into the ecosystem where we start to see lending, where we start to see uh, borrowing, and we're seeing leverage being brought into the whole DeFi space <coughs> and enabling this, we're now starting to see you know, people doing 250,000 transactions in a single week where they're taking Compound, interacting with 0x, levering up their positions, or, or doing what have you. Um, so we're seeing much more complex interactions. Additionally, with protocol bridges coming in, you're seeing um, you know, transactions of 300,000 transactions in a week where people are taking and building a protocol bridge between Compound and, and a CDP protocol, a CDP uh, pool together. It's also a lot going on, Uniswap, um, where you have a single token being swapped for another. We're seeing 510,000 transactions in a single week where Uniswap is interacting with DAI. So you start to look at the complexity, the complexity of these DAFs and the orchestration across the ecosystem, across transaction, across contracts, it becomes really, really interesting. Um, and multi-collateralized DAI, um, you, you, you know, you just kind of think about where we're going to be in a year from now, where you can actually take pieces and parts of smart contracts and start to orchestrate your new idea across those it becomes incredibly powerful where you start to add scalability and more efficiency and people start to share and, and you, we're, we're building building blocks that we can build on top of each other. The data is there for everybody to see. The thing that makes blockchain and crypto so powerful is that crypto and economics allow us to create these systems incentivize behavior, measure behavior, and then have data as an input and data as an output so you can measure your system, instrument things, and how they work. Um, like I said earlier, we're a crypto economics uh, data platform. We have market data, blockchain data, metrics, insights, web services, WebSocket, like me, WebSockets, RESTful API. Um, you can connect to us just like a, you would connect to a full node via RPC. Um, so feel free to come check that out our platform. So this is kind of in the graph that the uh, panel showed in the first uh, slide. We're somewhere in the middle. This is a tool that essentially, it's open source, it's on GitHub. You take it, you get any RPC enable Ethereum client and our tool. And what you get is the Postgres database and API with indexed chain data. So this is like something you can set up very easily on your own and control it. Um, what you get, you get blocks, you get uncles, you get transactions indexed by account, which is yeah something else that DApps need, and you get events log in indexed by transaction. You don't get contract messages, also known as internal transactions or traces, and you don't get your RPP. So, like if a viewer happens, data gets replaced, you can't see what got viewed, what transactions were removed, things like that. And you, we don't do any payload decoding with this as well. Uh, and I just wanted to like show it actually if my internet works. It does. So after cloning the repo, which I'm not going to do right now because it might be problematic, 
you get this configuration file where you put in like a note. In this case, I'm gonna start the uh, taking early. And you have here like a feature for lag, which if you don't want to handle with reorg, you can set up a lag of 10 and we'll just wait for like finality there so you can get that. But this is default to default right now. So when, once I start it up, it's just gonna start getting data. So yeah, once that config is set up, you can just do this. Starts up a Postgres, starts up a Redis. Let's see. I really want this to do a demo. I think it's fun. <laughs> see all the rules to break. Pay for an API address and you don't need a lot of data. This is just like one command, you get like a small cluster with the next data to take it. So that's all. But for more complex things like internal transactions and the more dynamic your handling, so for example, uh, you get an information of you can send a query with the latest uh, hash that you know about, and our API can tell you exactly what got rewarded in the meantime and what transactions got rolled back. For all of this, visit Alithio and check out the bigger API. Yeah. But for small needs, we build this, take it, use it. Thanks. Somebody has some questions yeah. for us. Questions? If you 
it seems like that would be challenging to use without internal transactions because especially if we go back to the previous fellow who was showing how many transactions are contract called these days. Um, is, it, like, is this something you're using? Yeah, like what, what, what are you, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, so, so you think it's difficult to use without uh... Yeah, like given that many, many transactions these days are internal transactions. Yeah. Contract calls. I guess it depends what the use case is, right? Like, of course, at, at this state, if you need uh, to understand internal transactions, this wouldn't be as useful. Or even that it's open source, it could be extended to uh, by supporting something like, but it would lock you into parity. That's one thing, or <laughs> something that gives you traces in a good way. But this, like, this was built to be like super agnostic. Just use any RPC you think would know. Yeah, that's kind of like if you if you can avoid using internal transactions that this is fine to use. If not, open a pull request. <laughs> and so the idea is that we, we try to give this to the community and wanted to see how this could evolve in a bigger mechanism of ingesting also more complex uh, stuff. Any other question? I can give you sweets. <laughs> Uh, that it is Ethereum blockchain, right? The yeah. That's but like not necessarily mainnet, just any 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 VM. private network or testnet. Yeah, basically just connected to you specify the node. Node, and that's it. For our use case in the demo, we use the purely on Ethereum. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, our next speaker is my colleague Valentin Mihong from Sentiment. Val is CTO of Sentiment, an all inclusive source of targeted intelligence for Ethereum. Val is a software engineer with over 10 years of experience building startups, and he won a silver medal in the International Olympiad of Informatics in 2004. He loves building great products, performance optimization, and advanced software like AI and scalable systems. And when he's not cracking up code, he's trekking in the mountains or kite surfing on a beach. Please join me in welcoming the mountain. So I hope everything goes according to plan. Um, and actually I'm going to start with the live demo because it's going to take some time to compile. <laughs> because I, I, I wanted to, uh, to show you how it looks from uh, end to end. So we built this tool, it's very similar um, to what the guys showed for uh, getting your own data analytics up and running in, a, in an easy way. Um, so we call it like names for lane, Ethereum name spoiler. Um, but the idea is to be able to export events out of the Ethereum blockchain and decode them and have them in a database where you can query them with SQL. So you can build your own API, you don't rely on any third party, and um, it should be very easy to set up. So in order to start, so first you, there is a project generator. So you need to install this thing, which is a project generator with NPM, and then this is the generator. Can you zoom in a bit? Yeah. So you need to install the Yoma, which is like a project generator for NPM, and then this is the generator for, uh, for this project. Then you create a folder with your exporter. So I'm going to start doing that. So I'm going to create a folder for it. And then I'm going to generate it. So it's going to ask me now what's the name of my constructor. And it's going to start building. Okay, now, while it's building. <laughs> so why, why we actually do this? Um, so we've been... Ah, okay. <laughs> so we have a blockchain, right? And in the blockchain we have some kind of events or transactions that are coming in. And usually the blockchain has uh, some... Uh, so it's going to have some API and we need to have some kind of connection to it. So we, we need, like, when we build a DAP, we need to have some API to, to go 
we want to create a UI, like for example, if you build Compound, you want to have a website for Compound to be able to see when somebody deposits something to show that, oh, you deposited, here is your balance. Or you want to see what is the current state of the market, how much money has been invested, uh, what is the, uh, for example, uh, the amount of money being deposited every day. So it's not only about fetching what is the latest transaction, but also you need some kind of aggregation on top of this. And you, you need such kind of aggregation not only for UI cases, but also, uh, for example, if you want to do fraud detection, let's say, or you know, whatever your needs are. So usually the full nodes don't provide you with an API for that. What full nodes gives you is, uh, give me all the data for a given block, or give me the data for a given transaction, or tell me what is the latest block. So they don't have any aggregation capabilities. They're not able to, say, like, select from all the deposits, uh, group them by day, and sum them up, and stuff like that. So the current APIs that you can rely on are either centralized, like, hour, <laughs> um, or they're not real-time, like uh, BigQuery, let's say. I actually, I was quite surprised that right now it's six blocks behind. Um, before that, it used to be like 24 hours. But also, uh, as um, uh, the CoinGet people mentioned, it's, uh, you need to have some batching on top of it, so it's not like a real-time thing that you can query all the time. So that, that's not going to work. Um, so if you are in the case where, okay, I built a DAP, I want to export the data somewhere, and I want to just run some SQL on top of it um, to get all my analytic needs, then there are not so many options out there. Also, but it's great that now they are, and it's, 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 it's amazing. So an analytics pipeline um, is going to look like something like this. So we have a full node. Um, then you have the data extractor that is going to extract the data from the full node, and then it's going to put it into some kind of a query system in order to be able to query it. So, why it's hard to decentralize that? It's hard because it relies on a lot of state. This is like the biggest problem. Like, uh, it's very hard to, uh, this, this state needs to be, like, the, the full nodes, they have the state in them, but it's organized in a specific manner that you know, depends on like, how the blockchain works. And it's very hard to build uh, and maintain this state. So the only way we can kind of figure out how to decentralize this is through open source. Let's make tools that are open source and people can use them to extract the data and to, uh, to get their, uh, their needs. So if you're able to just have an easy way to, to run a tool that's going to extract the data, put it into a database and you can build APIs on top of it, then everything will be good. Now why we do this like as a data provider? Well, we provide kind of more simple type of analytics, and then on top of it, we're going to provide some more complicated things that we're going to do APIs for. So this is basically why we do it. But the idea is, this data should be available to everyone, so it's good to have uh, decentralization and cooperation. So this is the URL to the project that I'm just showing. So let's go back to the demo. Oh, it's done. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> everything working so far. So we need to provide a URL to some uh, full node. For this, we're going to use uh, Infura, because this is the easiest way. Uh, let me exit from this screen. OK, this is my Infura project. I'm going to copy the URL to Infura. And I need to put it into my configuration file. So that will be here. So I'm going to do that here. I need to put here like HTTPS. Okay, and um, here I'm gonna specify from which block I want to start syncing. Uh, this is how many confirmation I want to wait for, so that we don't need to handle reorganization. So the same thing as before. And here's some batching and stuff. So let me specify like this one because I think there is more action happening there. Okay. And now I'm gonna run it with Docker Compose. Uh, Okay, so now the pipeline is going to start. <coughs> so this uh, project here that is generated uses the ABI of Compound. 
Uh, I found the compound API, uh, the compound uh, documentation to be very good. So it's, um, it's very nice to work with. So it started to sync the, the events now. And it's going to decode all the events, put them into a database, and this is all happening in real time. So let's see what we have um, here. So first, uh, we have uh, a very simple, let's look at the code. Or maybe, let's open the database. So we use a click house as a database. It's very, very fast analytics database. It's Colmar, and we are managing to handle like billions of records with that. So most probably it's going to, to do you some, some good work. You don't need anything. So, so I have, uh, this is the main table, events. And I'm going to select from events. Uh, I'm going to take the five records. And what we have is for every event, we have timestamp, the address uh, from which the event is coming from, the hash of the block, and here we have the decoded event. So in this case, we have a cure interest. So this is, as I said, compound. And it shows you like uh, what is the like borrow index, interest accumulated for this event and all that. So if we scroll up, you're going to see we have mostly <laughs> a cure interests here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have also approvals. Basically we put the API, uh, the API is going to extract all the events across all the uh, well, in this case, I think it's uh, limited to certain addresses, but you can extract it across the whole blockchain. And it's going to, as I said, sync uh, in real time. Okay, let's look at the code. So this is how the exporter looks like. This is basically it. So we managed to condense it into this, like, 10 lines of code. Um, so you get the API. Uh, okay, so you need to have the API. In this case, it's the compound API. Um, you instantiate a class, and you say extract events with API. That's it. Um, and here is a simple uh, REST API that is built with Micro. It's a JavaScript framework. And right now, it gives you what's the total amount of events and what is the events over time. So I can now go into the console and say curl. Uh, I think it's on port 2000 API. Events over time. Oh, yeah. And here's the aggregation that I get. So it's currently syncing, so it's going to take some time until it syncs through. But yeah, I mean, this is how it works. And you can take this thing and deploy it on your hosting. Like you only need Docker. Um, you you deploy it on DigitalOcean or something like that, and you get like. Analytics API for any smart contract. You just need the API. Actually, last night I was uh, playing with the DYDX uh, API and it managed to, to extract it. So, here is like an overview. Uh, the full node is in Fura, the data extractor is this repo, and the scalable system is this ClickHub database. Um, so, that's it. If you have any questions, I would like to answer. Them. Thank you. the events. <laughs> if you're interested in that. Is it is it only focused on events or do you do yeah you also right. do this uh, particular project is focused on events because uh, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. The truth is this uh, open source tool is using another open source tool which is more low level and for this one we actually use it for all kinds of data. For example I can show you uh, on our GitHub, it's again like an open source thing. Uh, we use this lower level uh, library that extracts all the trades from centralized exchanges. And it's basically again like in JavaScript. It's a bit longer, it's like 67 lines of code. But um, it extracts all the trades from these exchanges in real time and pushes them to the data. And now we can run uh, it. This is also open source. Yeah. 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 Yeah
what would be your ideal use case for this? What would you look at it for after? Well, I think it can be used basically for anything. Like, uh, if you want to have very granular data where you say, I want to take the latest transaction, the latest block, or whatever, up to I want to get some aggregation. Because with this database, particularly ClickHouse, like, the reason we use this and not Postgres, let's say, is that we found it's very fast in doing aggregations and analytics. Um, it's uh, developed by Yandex, so it has a very strong community behind it. And we've been able to run a lot of the things pretty much online without any need of doing batching like Chrome jobs or anything like this. So I would say, now, you need to be careful though, there are some trade-offs, like in software engineers there is, there is always trade-offs. So one of the trade-offs is that um, with this database, if you want to do some very complicated joints, it might be a bit tricky, uh, especially if you have two joints that with tables with billion records, then yeah, that's not going to work. But if you have like a billion records and maybe a million records, that would be fine. Um, so still, like if you want to join all the transactions with all the blocks, it's going to work. But maybe it will be slower if you want to go through the whole history. So you might still want to do aggregation. Uh, um, and the other thing is, uh, the way it works internally, uh, it's possible that there is a specific syntax that you need to use, which is different from Postgres. And so you need to be careful because uh, the database might return to some duplicate records. So in order to avoid that, you need to use, for example, select from final. And then you don't get it. So there are some kind of catches like this. That you can, use. Yeah. can you start the pipeline with multiple APIs, or is it like one API, for instance? Uh, multiple APIs? ABI, ABI. Uh, ah, ABI. Yeah, yeah. Can you um, multiple or just one, for instance? Yeah, currently it's one, for instance. But you can share the same database. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, if you look at the Docker Compose, so this is how the Docker Compose looks like. So we have, uh, like, Zookeeper and Kafka are just storage. Uh, ClickHouse is the database. And Exporter is basically the script that's doing the uh, export. So you can run multiple exporters here and connect them to the same database. And this server is the API uh, that's yeah. These are the components. What you can do actually, you can probably merge the APIs together into a single API because it's just a super API. Yeah, a super API because it's, the API is just a list of descriptions. Right? And you can just merge the two lists and then use the super API. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. Thank you. Okay, so the next part of our session here is going to be interactive. We're going to be looking at kind of three parts of the Ethereum data set. So um, if you have a uh, post-it at the end of your like seek area, um, you might want to note down three things. So something that you need, something that you're looking for in terms of data supply, any challenges that you're having, so you can kind of pack them out here. And um, yeah, anything you can contribute. So if you're looking for opportunities, this type of stuff, um, if you have a skill you'd like to contribute, um, we share those types of things. And just before we do that, try to like to gauge the level of the audience here. Is anyone looking for something more advanced than what? presenters have presented. Raise your hand. Someone looking for a little bit like entry level? I'm actually sorry, I would say more advanced. More advanced. One thing that, one yeah. thing that hasn't been touched on is uh, watching memorable transactions. Sorry. Well, uh, watching memorable transactions, so uh, pending but haven't been confirmed yet, yeah. and being able to get like live streams of that. So if anybody knows about that, and yeah. I'd love to talk yeah. to you. We can do it on our API oh, cool. website. It's on any smart contract in real time. Cool. So you can also watch the same token that brought 20 on pages on all your books. Man. Sorry, what was that? Uh, you can also watch your token. Ember data. Ember data? Yeah, I think our talks are actually.
Anyone else looking for something specific? Yeah. Well, I can contribute something, maybe that's the time now, because uh, I'm with big events and we do internal transactions, actually, yeah. and uh, we also have all the APIs. So uh, we do that on function calls, so we have over 90% of all function calls covered, and we put that in the PostgreSQL database and in Elasticsearch cluster, so you can use either whatever fits your needs and grab all the data for free. And you can actually do the math and time series on database with that clear text data with us. So if anybody wants to use us, feel free. It's like eth.events and all the data is there. Okay. Hey. Oh, uh, uh, in uh, the beginning of this year, we built uh, a server monolithic database on the house. Uh, it's the uh, price to you can start to eat uh, one command. And uh, as we also use click house, it's uh, uh, best case uh, for our analysis data. And uh, you need only uh, one standalone server, uh, one week for uh, synchronized uh, model, and you can use uh, all your all, all the server data uh, or on your server. And uh, this uh, database uh, is uh, under mid license, and you can use it free. one of the reasons we've been thinking about how you decentralize such kind of APIs. And like, if you're using a, a, an API from a provider, you can't really be sure if they're not having, like even, it could be like a mistake in the data, right? It might not be like deliberate uh, uh, like error or something like that. Um, and the only way, I guess, you know, is to think how you decentralize, so you don't need to trust a third party. Well, through open source, like you need to use your own open source pipeline. So if you want to do that, then using some kind of a tool that you run locally and you connect to a full node that you trust, um, that will be the way to approach. Like I, I don't think there is uh, any other way that you can really trust. Uh, I have a different one, okay. Yeah, so I think the blockchain is the source of truth. So anybody who aggregates data like you or like us or like Impura, how can you verify that that data is correct? So what we do is we allow every single API call that we return, we do the, the basic kind of checks of the verbal proof from our chain data, so you can always compare that our on-chain data is correct with the off-chain data. Because a lot of people that aggregate data because of the block reorganizations, they collect wrong data. Like, yeah, so if you don't continuously scrub that and, and be able to verify it, then you could be serving that data. So by serving your verbal proof with your data, you can verify. So that's what we do. So because otherwise people are going to be you know, making it up, you know, potentially on that data. But if you serve an aggregation, like let's say you yeah. want to show number of transactions per day, let's say. Yeah. And, and there's another interesting question that we can actually measure that in a different ways. I mean, if you talk about number of transactions for a given token, is it only transfers or does it include maybe some other operations? Like, does it include also uh, like approvals and that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's so really true. Then, then it becomes, like if you serve like a given block, then you can verify that. I mean, block has a cache, so it's, it's fine. If you serve a transaction, yeah, we can verify. But when it comes down to aggregations, then it becomes freaky. Yeah, that's really true. And uh, I want to agree with you, uh, if you count things, you can count things uh, several ways. Yeah. For example, the easiest one would be, uh, do you include the Genesis block as a transaction or not? Yeah. That's yeah. already a difference of one. 
Yeah. And there's many, many more. If you go down the rabbit hole, there will be many more. For example, do you count uh, internal transactions differently than normal transactions? Yeah. Are they just like transactions? You heard that already for us, yes. that's a problem. If you put in a separate table, you guys can do it in the same table. Yeah. Yes. That would be different as a select statement then. Yes. And also, when you start aggregating the data, actually, you're going to find some really weird uh, so one of the things that we found is that, uh, you know, during the ICOs, uh, because of all these pre-sales, sometimes they don't advertise events for the pre-sales on the blockchain. So you start aggregating, for example, you want to find what are the top holders of a given token, and the results doesn't match. And when you go down the rabbit hole, you actually find that in the smart contract, there is a list of addresses that are going to receive a bunch of tokens uh, when the contract is created, let's say, and this is not advertised on the blockchain at all. And even more interesting thing is, some of these top holders are not even shown on ether scan. And what happens is that the first time you open an address for a given token on ether scan, they're going to query the full node, figure out that they have some kind of balance for this token, and include it in the top holders list. So we've found, you know, holders with millions of dollars of tokens that hasn't even check them on the scan. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. So, yeah. it's a different around the call. <laughs> well, this will be. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, it's interesting how they handle the DAO hack. Like, uh, uh, yeah. can you explain that more? Uh, the, like, they yeah. are called the uh, change the balances in the. Uh, yeah, like so basically, client without uh, emitting any transactions, transfer or anything. So, so well, that refers to something we call accounting, and we actually haven't implemented accounting yet. So, uh -huh. we ask the node for that, but the question is who owns or what address owns what balance of tokens, or either is not even a token, but it's a special thing. So, and that is explicitly hard, and uh, we think the most uh, robust way would be to query the node for each block backwards. Because the node is the only tool that actually has the state. Otherwise, if you do the math yourself, so if you compute the state, I think you can say something on that as well. Uh, uh, no, we said, uh, who was it? Uh, Alethio found that. It said, you can't recompute the state of the node uh, correctly because there's all sorts of quirks. Yeah. And this adds up to this. So you actually have to ask the node. And but yeah, in order but how, to ask how, a yeah, node, how? you need archive node, which is uh, yes. like four terabytes or like terabytes of storage. We also run archive nodes, so everybody wants an RPC port for archive nodes. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't advertise that. Yeah. If you solve a transaction or an event, how do you know what address to ask for? Like, you need to ask the balance of a given address, but how do you know what to ask for? No, you can actually ask the node for the balance of that address. Yeah, but you reply. Yeah, but if uh, the, the balance of that, this address was created without meeting a transfer uh, event or without transaction in the case of DAO hack, how do you know that you have to ask for this address? Well, then you don't. If you don't know, if you don't know what the address you're asking for, then you don't have the your most basic information. Well, but you might be asking, I want to get for a given address all the balances this address has for all the tokens that implement ERC20. And then it becomes complicated. Yeah, this, this is a way harder problem, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to say, hey, what's my time series historical account balances for my, you know, all of my, you know, show me my last, just my last 360 days change in token balances. You get into like call 2 million blocks, aggregate, take all of your logs, take and extract your token values, then go out and get market prices, map that off. It's like a massive amount of things. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 But yeah. not with mark price. We have that available today. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to do. Yeah, it's but how did you get it? You asked the note for every block that appeared. And we, we yeah, I mean, just like you and probably a few other people here in Olympia, like we replayed every transaction since the Genesis block and you know extract and make that easily accessible. Because blockchain is not easily searchable. We make that available. Just like mm -hmm. For us, we, we don't do it through archive nodes because we figure out this is going to be insanely slow. Yeah. Um, so for the so we basically reviewed most of the contracts. And 
found such kind of discrepancies. Actually, it's very easy to find the discrepancies because when you start, uh, like, if, if you look at not the top coders but the small coders, uh, if there is, if somebody gave, uh, yeah, maybe that's no, yeah, yeah that's if somebody gave tokens under the table, <laughs> let's let's say, and this uh, address uh, gave the tokens to somebody else, you have negative balance. Yeah. So when you see a negative balance, you see that somebody is doing something funky on the contract. But, but at the end it has to sum up, so you will never have like all balance. You can't do that. It's actually not true. There's, there is contracts that the total circulating supply is higher than the amount wanted on the smart contract. I don't know how it's possible, but I can go a couple of accounts that that's true. They, they just don't, like they, they, they. So essentially you are saying it's not a deterministic spectrum. No, I'm they saying are somebody hacked it, or somebody, there's something, something's going on somewhere, but there's traded tokens on exchanges today that have circulated supply higher than the total account. Somebody just transferred tokens, minted tokens, without adding them to the total supply. <laughs> yeah, basically. I don't know. Total supply is just like a field, that's true. Yeah. It's a field, yeah. yeah. I mean, you yeah. can decide not to update your number. Yeah. I've also seen uh, events that, like, uh, they said that someone transferred like uh, 10,000 times the amount of uh, total supply to a given address, mm -hmm. the transaction failed, but the event was still emitted, and you can say, <laughs> yes, like, uh, yeah, that's why you don't go for events. Events yeah. for accounting is a bad choice. Events is totally optional for a developer, and you essentially can write in there whatever you want. You can actually do something different. You, you could do a call and emit something different. You could rewrite what yeah. the event would be. I, I'm not aware that someone did, but uh, that is. Totally well, I think this particular case that you say, there was a bug in the smart contract that uh, they were emitting events even though the transaction fails. Like they check, oh, do I have enough money to transfer? Oh, I don't, but I emit an event before that. Yeah. And and this is like, I, I think at the end of the day, this contract is unusable. Basically, this is a hack. It needs to be marked as this is garbage and thrown away. Because if you have a wallet that that needs to uh, like like work with these things. The wallet there is a high chance it's going to rely on events, and it's going to show like crazy stuff. So I don't know. Events should be like they're built for having reliable view on the state of the things, how they change. Not all contracts are uh, like. And, and the other interesting thing is there is not really good standard. Uh, like ERC20 is not a good standard no. at all. <laughs> no. Like there are no events there for minting and for burning tokens. So how do you calculate the total supply out of events you can't? Yeah. Uh, there is a better standard, which is like I don't remember the number, but nobody uses that. <laughs> so <laughs> is this why you don't remember the number? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's exactly what we learned too, and I don't think that events ever have they meant to be a reliable form of communication. Mm -hmm. I think it's a totally optional communication because it is on the hands of the developer how to use an event within a function call. It's not a precise log of a function call. It's something additional. But then what is your connection with the outside world? Like you, the smart contract needs to have some kind of a connection to your outside world. And like the events are the closest it comes to that. True. But um, it's up, to, it's up to the developer how to use it in an event, and it doesn't have to be the same as the function call. Or in a, in a tight relationship, it can be in a loose relationship, and that needs room for interpretation. It's not a definition. Yeah. Well, on the bright side, I see, like, for example, for DeFi, I see uh, some very nice events. Like the smart contract that are built, like the latest generation, seems to be much more well behaved from events perspective. So if you want to build uh, some dashboard about DeFi that tracks like interest rates and borrows and all that, events will be a pretty good way to do it. Besides so it's Mega. Really? Yeah, Mega has like a lot of weird stuff going on. Mm. Well, yeah. Maker, I mean, and Maker is weird on its own, like it has like yeah. very weird uh, field names. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. and that's how it starts. Do you actually have to write a maker parser for events, yeah. which is, sucks big yeah. time. So yeah. then it, it, this is actually, if you probably know, you might know as well, but if you go down the rabbit hole and 
to interpret events and use them as a means of communication, the more complex the smart contracts get, the worse it gets. And I think there needs to be some sort of standardization in that process as well. The key value field names is just the start. And there, there will be way more. If, and actually, if you go for, say, not proof of work, for a cheaper chain, you could actually use this as, as means of interface. Like, heavily rely on events. That would be a total move, actually, a change how to interact with blockchain. And I think this could happen, like on, on proof of uh, uh, authority chains, for example, if the, if the transaction is cheaper. Yeah, well, something that we noticed is that uh, once you remove the proof of work, like with EOS, then a lot of spam starts to happen. So this kind of analytics, it starts to take a huge amount of space. Um, for example, for EOS, if you want to crunch the whole blockchain and put it into like analytics database and uh, input all the internal transactions into the mix. So basically throw out everything like with the chip um, It's like almost four terabytes of compressed JSON, like the whole thing. And it's been running for one year. <laughs> I wonder what these guys are doing. You have like a 400 millisecond clock time with Solana. So I wonder no, how... No, he's, he's not from Solana, he's actually from Sentiment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but like, they are really fast and they have like insane rates, uh, block, block rates. No worries. And I wonder what you do then for analytics. Yeah. For interesting, you mentioned EOS. Uh, when, you, when you stake, you get kind of those side tokens. I, I forget the actual terminology, but you know, Everpedia, EOS DAC. Uh, will they get lost in the spam and their value? Do you think? Or will they? Will they, if, will they use case continue on despite despite the spam? Or, or, or what tokens you refer to? Uh, Everpedia is one. It's like ah. a decentralized Wikipedia. Okay. EOS DAC as well used to be as well. So. But the spam is more like people posting random stuff. Like, right. There is a there is this side contract that they're not even doing tokens. Like this spam is not even transfers of tokens. Just people publishing some binary data on the blockchain. Uh, or yeah, I mean it's it's really weird. Uh, but you need to keep it because you know you're doing analytics, so you need to have everything, and uh, it's insane. <laughs> like uh, I, I think for one year of Pio's, uh history. We had to build, like it took us maybe six months in order to build a special full node. Like we need to plug into the full node itself in order to be able to extract the data fast. And it took one month to extract everything. Because <laughs> it's about four terabytes. Right? Oh I suspect there will be more. So as for example, big chain DB, where actually store data on the chain, or as I mentioned, Solana. Mm -hmm. I think this will be new challenges. But how do you, like, how it is a blockchain anymore <laughs> if it's uh, having this amount of data? Like, you won't be able to run this anywhere. Like, Ethereum right now, it's possible to run it. Like, it's, if it's not an like archive node, you can run a full node locally. It's probably going to take, like, 300 gigabytes. But still, like, there are laptops with 300 gigabytes of disk. Uh, so it's still possible. Uh, but with something like these other blockchains, I don't know how it's going to work. <laughs> Like it's insane. It's not decentralized anymore. Well, I suppose for Solana, we have to ask Anatoly. He gave a nice thing yesterday. He's not here, but there's many others, the big chains, they do this in a private environment. It's machine to machine communication, so there will be many of those big chain things. And I suppose there's many others. Uh, they, they all have just different use cases. They're probably not public chains. But they all have the archive problem and the audit problem as well. If you like uh, have mounts of data, you tend to chuck it off and throw it away at some point. So the only thing that has to do is the node in the state with power on. If you lose the power, you might lose the state as well. Yeah. That's why we exist, I suppose. <laughs> Didn't Ripple already lost some of the state like for that thousand? I've heard of it, but I can imagine. What is Ripple? A ripple. A ripple? Sorry, ripple. 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 Ah, ripple. Ah, ripple. Ah, ripple. Yeah. Is it for people? I don't mind. Ripple <laughs> 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 you know, is also an interesting case. Like, I was seeing uh, this guy that was building XRP scan 
So Winters came from Ripple and he was boasting how, yeah, I run my own node now and like it's on a pizza box in this data center. Like it took me three months to sync it and like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Like, oh, you need like 10 terabytes of storage or something like that. And they actually write this in the documentation. If you want to sync a full Ripple node, you need 10, I think at least 10 terabytes of storage and it adds 10 gigabytes per day. Okay. This is only for the node. Like, and and it's not just like what runs the value between banks. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> I, I don't know what's the case there. It's, uh, I mean, we, we crunch it, so there is activity there, but... You actually run Ripple nodes and analyze Ripple data? No, ah. we don't run our nodes. We rely on external nodes. It's just insane. I mean, there is no Amazon servers with that much hard drives. <laughs> we hit the limit of Amazon, so... Yeah, like, yeah. Ripple moved their, their, when they were coming on cloud, they moved their network marketing to the cloud because that was the only one that would give them that many terabytes of SSDs. Yeah. The other exactly. cloud providers couldn't do it. Yeah. So we, we use their own, uh, their nodes. Like the, we need to rely on the Ripple nodes in order to start the data because, yeah, it's just not possible to run a full node. So this is how far the decent presentation goes. Uh, by the way, this is Alan from Google uh, BigQuery. Uh, <laughs> you can ask him questions because Alan, you missed it. it was a very first presentation was using BigQuery to obtain data from the team. Yeah. Just a little bit missed. And this so was happy everybody's finding some how many how many BigQuery users are there in here? Okay, not as many as I hope for. Well, you can all, you're all welcome to do it. <laughs> you still can grow. It's still grow, that's right. Yeah. One more question, uh, do you ever plan to use APIs uh, and translate the data so you can actually do math using BigQuery with blockchain data? Well, say that again. <laughs> well, your data is not elaborated, it's a dump. So uh, there's, you need an API to transfer hex binary data to your numbers. And uh, to use BigQuery at its full potential, you would like to do the calculations with this integrated data, with this translated data. Do you so want to, you want to uh, de decompile the APIs you need? No, use the API to uh, translate the data and integrate it. To execute the, to take the data and input it and translate it into something else. Yeah, by executing it in, in, in a virtual. In clear text, in numbers, so you can actually do the math. So uh, I think you can do this by using the, aren't there some Ethereum JavaScript uh, libraries that could be used to do this? Yeah, well, and I have to do the math afterwards myself. Uh, what he means, can he, he say, was, he can he say for his bill when it's part of BigQuery, if I understand his question? So I, I remember uh, Nick Johnson did something like what you're describing with the FJS library by calling it from a, so all of the BigQuery UDFs are written in JavaScript. And he found a way to shim in FJS into a UDF such that he could run an EVM emulator inside BigQuery. So there's a lead for you. I don't know how far he got on that, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he was doing something like that. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the terminology, but that sounds like a stored procedure kind of thing. Yeah, UDF is, it stands for user defined function. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's So you call a JavaScript, you include a JavaScript mm -hmm. library so that you can then call these functions. I see. ENS apparently is, is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, using, as part of the registry, they're, they're, uh, they're, they have some contracts, right? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to reproduce the, the results of the contract calls inside of the query call. Because Nick, Nick here, I'm probably not doing justice. But yeah, something like that. Cool. So it's already supported. Well, I have to do it by myself. And I have to have all the APIs and function hash and whatnot. But yes. that's good because then they come to us. <laughs> I guess the right thing to do would be to take the, if you know what contract was called and you had the ABI, you could automatically process it and produce the output. But the problem is, is that the structure of the inputs and the outputs are very flexible. So we couldn't really define a schema that would easily support all of that that would be easy to query. It would just be kind of nest of, or repeated field of blobs, which doesn't really buy you anything other than having done the execution of the ABI. No. So you no, need basically have to key value, value key yeah. 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 It's and not very structured. No, but it's a list of key values. Every, every contract can have different uh, 
key values. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. in BigQuery, you need to define the schema. Yeah. So if you index like thousand different contracts, you have yeah. different keys, and the majority will be like yeah, yeah. yeah. It will be flat. But yeah. yeah. So with this uh, pipeline that I showed, so currently the schema there is unified for all the events. So it has this field code decoded, which contains a JSON basically with the decoded Absolutely. data. And then uh, you have a function in the database called like JSON extract string, let's say. You specify the key and it's going to extract the key. You know, so you can then get the data this way. But there is also a possibility, um, it's something that I didn't show, like with this five lines of code, you can plug in a uh, callback and take the decoded data and emit like a flat JSON out of it. So you can rearrange the data whatever you want. And then there is a SQL script used for initialization to create a table. And you just need to create the tables with the same schema. So you can adjust it in a way that, okay, I'm parsing, let's say, compound events, uh, like, like these events, and this is my schema I want to support. So I'm going to translate it in the script and insert it denormalized. So it's a possibility to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to get some feedback and see if this actually solves any problems for people. Uh, we use this pipeline for our own needs, uh, for uh, many of the things. And it's been working pretty well. So we extracted it from our pipelines. Um, but uh, yeah, we use it a little bit different. Like we tend to normalize the data into fields. We don't want to extract JSONs because it's slower. <laughs> so, uh, but for the demo and for the project, you need to have a unified schema. But yeah, might be possible to extend. Do you have uh, like uh, have you have you encountered any kind of such kind of problems um, for DApps that you write? Like you write a DApp and you want to build like UI for it or maybe some um, analytics for it? Like have you encountered such kind of problem? Or is anyone in the room building tabs, visualization, aggregation, any stuff? Like where you can find the cheapest uh, or the highest level of uh, loan rate at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or alternatively, if somebody was curious about mempool, talking about data in the mempool, is, uh, is that this is thing chain. Yeah. Oh, he left. Oh, he left. <laughs> So, was anybody else interested in mempool discussing that? Yeah, mempool is an interesting topic, yeah. yeah. Is there, since there's no problem, people, is anybody of the solution people doing mempool <laughs> currently? Did you yeah, we, check the mempool? We look at the mempool. Uh, we, I don't think we have exposed any metric on top of it so far. But uh, I believe the mempool is useful for front runners. <laughs> yeah, and prediction. Yeah. Prediction. Yeah. 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 Do, do, do you, you can see immediately when yeah. things are changing. Yeah. Yeah. It's about. Was it like a gigabyte per day? Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. For, for one geolocation. For the cost it's, yeah, it's no, it's no uh, We just run a node and yeah. get the main pool that the node does. Like, we haven't done much complicated stuff. So I can just yeah, do that. Gigabyte. One gig a day. Something like this, but I'm, I, I need to double check. Like, I, I'm not gonna, because it might be like, because I was uh, recently working on the trades from centralized exchanges to extract that. If that was about, like, for these five or six exchanges, about one gigabyte per day. So maybe I'm, uh, I'm thinking about that. So I, I need to double check. Yeah, yeah but we have a use case for mempool from a wallet provider. And they want to display for their customers that the transaction got submitted and it's not good enough to have the first block which we actually have, yeah. which is kind of weird. But yeah, but, yeah, but what about uh, mempools? Has anyone built uh, something workable? Or a little bit? You, you, want, you wanted to say something about mempool? Or well, you want just, somebody just asked, write, Yeah, write. somebody asked it and then posted yeah, yeah. but then left, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for us, we just do basic mempool aggregation as well to show with the explorer like the state of transaction that we've seen. Mm -hmm. We take the determine the time spent in the mempool and things like that, but nothing fancy aggregation either as well. We're thinking about it, but we didn't really find a good use. It's like apart from what you mentioned, like showing the transactions as soon as you can see yeah. by anything, but that's like a basic use case, I don't know. That's uh, just the real-time aspect, so you don't yeah. keep any data for longer terms as well. 
Oh, we do, we do keep some records of it, but which has just have the data in cool analytics on that yet. Yeah, we also use that to figure out the, what does actually get expired from the mempool, and I like, kind of have this whole the list and the database. But so yeah, it's like a, what is that network hygiene uh, parameter? Yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, basic question: If you run a pool, can you get access to all the mempool or just partial? So you need to have uh, uh, geographically decentralized yes. full nodes. They are, they, are, they are different. And I say well, that was actually would be a nice question. So how nice. much do they differ? Usually they shouldn't differ much, but they might. You mean yeah. in terms of when the transaction is first seen? Uh, no, where it is in the mempool. So the, the mempool, as far as I know, is not equal over the globe. There, yeah. There's okay. different mempools and different... So they they tend to get equal over uh, blocks, uh, sure. but, uh, so the transaction in the mempool is first, but initially they're not. It also kind of depends on where the transactions are mostly coming from. So like if you do meta masking for if that's the source, then that's going to be your main input. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Because then, then they get propagated out from there. But yeah, wow. it's hard to know when you see a transaction in your node, kind of the uh, what half of mempool distribution that transaction is like how long ago like you can have like 500 milliseconds when it got to the first node yeah. that's possible you just, just see it in the block as soon after you get the mempool yeah. so it's yeah mm -hmm.